where your nostril attaches to your front lip, your top lip, and separating it, tearing it up into your nostril. Just imagine how that feels. That's what that elephant's just managed to do there. Obviously having absolutely no effect on the function of his trunk, it must just have been quite sore. Now let's see what he does. Let's see if he has it in him to walk past that big bull. And that will give us an idea of where he is. is. If this young male is approaching maturity, he won't walk close to that big bull elephant. If he's still an immature bull, not quite a toddler, but sort of a preschooler, if I could put it to you that way. Prepubescent is what I'd like to say, probably. He will walk quite close to that bull elephant. No, looks like he's stopping there and waiting. Not that he's in any way a threat to this bull elephant. It's just conditioning, genetic conditioning. So that tells me that he is approaching the time when he needs to start thinking about leaving. They leave anywhere from about 12 to 15 years. It's not a definite age. This elephant could be anywhere from, if he's a big elephant, he could be as young as nine eight or nine if he's a, a slightly smaller elephant he could be anywhere up to 12 or 13 years old he looks like he's wanting to pass this big bull he's giving him his space you can see he's gone out of his way now not to walk down the road where all the rest of his family has gone and there he follows this big bull i think we're going to start our car and carry on going with this elephant herd Let's see if we can follow them a little bit. It also gives my shiny forehead a bit of a break from the direct sun. Yeah. Ah, Mohammed, all the way from Doha. Good afternoon, Mohammed. You've asked me, are there any other water sources in this part of the Kruger National Park other than the one that they've just been at? Absolutely. The Sabi sand is, I would say, well known for having an overabundance of pumped pans. Um, there's one thing that these animals do not lack of in the Sabi sands here, and that's options to fresh water. Um, they don't, however, have options to a lot of fresh food, and that's what these elephants are going to be primarily concerned with at the moment, is getting enough nutrition from the vegetation around them. They've got a long way to go. There will be, luckily for us, uh, around about the middle of August, which is not too long away from here, there's a flush of green growth and flowers on trees, the knob thorns, a lot of the acacias start to flower. Uh, we've got um, weeping boar beans that flower, shambok pods that flower. A lot of trees push out their first leaves and do a lot of their flower parts, the reproduction of themselves, they do early on in the season. And they, these elephants will have a slight boost then but we will only really get rain here in October again and the grass will only be really lush from about November, mid-November into December. So they've still got a long way to go. I still predict these elephants losing a lot of condition between now and, and the end of October. We call it hell month out here and things are going to get dire towards the end of that month. Now you can see that he's put himself between me and the herd, which is not uncommon to do. It's just him reacting to our presence. What we need to do is not to antagonize him. And as you can see, or you may have heard, I've just switched off the engine of the car. He's not showing me any untoward aggression. He just put me between himself and the herd. And what that tells me is he's almost got like a protective instinct going there. Or he sees me as a bit of a threat. That's just his testosterone that's busy talking to him. But rather than escalate the situation, we just take heed of these, of these bulls. And while he's deciding what he's doing, have a look at these two youngsters having a bit of a wrestle with one another. <laughs> that's exactly our elephant fight. Picture what they're doing now. That is exactly what these big bulls get up to, only with the addition of tusks. A titanic battle is how it is.
Now, Kirsten, all the way from Denmark, um, and I'd like to say good evening to you, Kirsten. Um, you've asked me if the bull will fight with any of these calves. Um, no, he will not. He only will fight with mature bull elephant and preferably other mature bull elephant in must. So it's a way that Mother Nature doesn't make these big guys hammer one another just wherever they come across one another. It's literally just mature bull elephants and then elephant bulls that are also in must. So it limits the damage that they do. And really, the mature bull elephants in the Kruger National Park, and I'm talking about 40 to 55 years of age, although there's a few of them, they spread out over the entire 3.5 million hectare. And that is a lot of ground to cover. Generally speaking, a herd of elephant with any females that are approaching estrus in it is usually attended by, by one, possibly two of these giants in the bush. So it's not like elephant are running around smashing one another up. Um, I think at most I've seen five or six bull elephant around a particular herd. There was a number of females that were coming into estrus or into season at the same time and this had collected all these males around and there was intense fighting for the position, the prime position. But because so many females were coming into estrus, I judged that at about three or four of them um, the competition amongst these males was just something epic. But that's one sighting in 20 years or 17 years of doing what I'm doing today. So it's definitely not a very common sighting that we see. Perhaps in areas where elephants are more numerous. And the, the Kruger National Park has roughly, depending on what report you read, but around about 20,000 elephants in 3.5 million hectares. Um, for example, the Chobe National Park has about 100,000 elephant in, a, in an area a third of the size. Um, you can see, you can go and see different elephant behavior in parts of the African parks that have a different density of elephants in. Uh, but here, still too few elephant to have any sort of massive conglomerations of aggressive bulls around herds. Now you can see this male, he's now decided that the, the females have moved off. And because we're not making any advances on the herd, he's decided to follow them. And that's just the way that we sort of read the animals out here. It takes a long time to get comfortable with elephant. And I must be honest, it's one of the animals that you make your quickest faults with. They will lull you into a false sense of security and then... Quite often young guides have very big frights from bull elephant or female elephant in tight areas. <clears throat> bull elephants are not shy about walking into camps and coming to drink out swimming pools. And quite often young guides cut their teeth, uh, so to say, on learning how to deal with elephants on foot in camps. And in vehicles, obviously, you don't want to get close on foot to a herd of elephant, but in vehicles you can get yourself into some very sticky situations quite quickly with elephant herds in very thick bush. And quite often you find guides making mistakes and getting big frights. In actual fact, I'd go so far as to say that almost every guide that I know of has a scary experience with elephant and it happened in the first two to five years of their guiding careers. Have a look at that youngster playing on this pile of sand. We've actually just had the overflow of Buffelsook Dam fixed. There is every indication that we have a that we have a Lanina effect brewing over the western continent of South America. And what we've done here is we've managed to upgrade the dams, we've helped the dams with the potential of holding a bit more water if we have a high rainfall year, which is predicted. But anyway, we'll talk about more of that, I'm sure, later on in today's show or at some other point. And uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to send you over to Jamie, who's got an update on those cats for you. Uh, my update is that I've... Oh, there. Oh, that's a slender mongoose. Never mind. Um, my update is that I found one of the lepers, and I think I found Cindile. I was, once we double-checked this whole area, 
I was just out on foot double checking into the drainage line and I walked along a little bit and I just saw a tail disappearing in here. Uh, I think he's feeling a little bit skittish on foot so I'm speaking nice and softly and I'm just going to wait for him to relax a little bit. I don't think he would have gone too far. He would be somewhere around here. I think we just took each other by surprise ever so slightly. And we'll just wait here and see if he doesn't pop out. So we're quite we're a bit further away from where the kill is. He was sleeping in the shade. And my first time actually encountering Sindilo on foot since he has returned back to the Sabi Sand. We had some wonderful adventures together, him and I, when he was still a cub and he decided that the best fun in the world that he could have would be to stalk me all the way back to the vehicle when I tried to track him one day. So he is here. He's hiding somewhere on the other side of this this mound here. Now that could mean that it is really, really tricky for us to get the vehicle to him. It might be worth moving off for now and then coming back at a later stage. Sorry, hold on one second. I think he might have... He may have walked into Mvula on that side because I heard a low sound. It was not quite growling. It was just a sort of a rrrr, which might have me, which might mean that he's bumped into Mvula. It's worth just sitting here for now. I want to just let him relax before I go in and just let his heart rate settle before we move the vehicle in. Obviously he's much more relaxed with cars than he clearly is with people on foot. He's forgotten what that's like in his time away from the wild. So while we sit here, wait for Sindile to relax a little bit and then move in to see if we can't get a view. Let's go back to Steph and see what his plans are. Well, I must congratulate Jamie on finding Sindile on foot. What an awesome experience. Finding Leopard on foot must be one of the most exciting experiences you can have as a guide, and I'm quite happy for Jamie. In, inside, a little bit jealous as well. These Elias have moved off into a little bit of thick bush, but underneath the Voyatela Dam wall, which has given us an opportunity quite unique, or rare, not unique, but quite rare, to actually be above an elephant. Can you imagine? And that's what we've got here, is we are above this full-grown female. And although it's not that amazing, it is rare <laughs> to be above these, these Ellie's. I just have the most wonderful time with elephant. To me, they sort of epitomize everything that Africa is for me. As savage, as colossal, as sad in some instances, or tragic I suppose is the better word. As susceptible to our sort of encroachments and fetishes. But that's getting a bit melancholy. Have a look at this. We've got a female elephant literally 10 or 15 yards away from us. Calf in tow. We are standing at least double as high above her as what you're likely to get anywhere. And we get a nice chance to see what she's choosing to eat. There's not much here, I must be honest with you. And they'd need to eat roughly about 150 kilograms of food a day. Males are eating anywhere up to 250 kilograms of food a day. So anywhere from sort of 300, there's a, that big bull pushing over the jackalberry there. Let's have a look over there. They can reach five and a half meters into the sky. So what would that be? It'd be about 17 foot into the sky with their trunks. And they can actually stand on their back feet. But because of their strength, they hardly ever do that. Instead, choosing to do what you're witnessing now, and that's bring the leaves down to a more acceptable level by pushing them over. Let 
Now, football hero has asked me how sensitive is an elephant's trunk. A quite quite sensitive uh, f football hero. If you have a look at this elephant on the right hand side here, the one with the mud on its face, and you, we, we zoom in on the trunk, you'll be able to see a lot of hairs. Now, apart from the trunk having more than a hundred thousand different muscle fibers in it, it's also covered in hair and it's also covered in nerves. An elephant can feel incredibly well with the tip of their trunk. I would almost liken it to how sensitive your lips are. So if you think about how light a touch you can distinguish using your top lip or your bottom lip and the temperatures that you can distinguish and how you can discern shape and texture with your lip, that is about as sensitive as the end of an elephant's trunk. It has quite thick skin on it, but with a hair on it, with its ability to move, and then with that incredibly sensitive tip in those two fingers, it makes for a wonderful appendage. Very strong. Able to pick up something as small as a little marble and quite easily push down a tree with a diameter as thick as your waist. Very, very easily indeed. Now see that elephant has now broken that tree, effectively killing it, and then decided that it was a bad idea to eat it anyway, and has now left it to stand in the sun. Now we've got this elephant behind us, left it to stand in the sun. Now we've got this elephant behind us sneaking up on us. This is not good. So what I'm going to do is just put my hand on the starter. There we go. Now it's never a good idea for elephant to sneak up on you. They do tend, some elephants, especially old ones like this, can develop bad habits. I don't know this herd at all. Have a look at how this young elephant gets up that slope amazingly agile. You think that an elephant couldn't get down there at all or up there and they've just managed to climb up virtually soundlessly. But anyway, that elephant decided that there was nothing, we were no threat at all, but it's always a good thing to be wary around elephant that do that sort of thing. I've been around enough elephants to know that you can't trust them and just when you think you can trust them, they'll go and do something like sneak up behind you and then push your car or push a tree down on you. So luckily we didn't have to clap our hands or start the car or move away, create some distance. That elephant literally was just using that path, came up behind us, had a bit of a look and has now walked off along the other side. It'll be interesting to see if the rest of this herd actually follow her lead. That should indicate to me that this female was the matriarch and that she dictates where the herd goes for that day. If she then rejoins the herd, it tells me that she's not the matriarch but one of the matriarch's sisters or even one of the matriarch's older daughters and uh, the matriarch would then still be on our right hand side here. But I see that this particular herd hasn't moved off after that female at all. So there's a good chance that the matriarch or the oldest, wisest member of this, female member of this particular herd is still within this group somewhere. Yes, there are a lot of calves here. <laughs> uh, Jonathan S. has just asked me, why do elephants have toenails? Um, good question, Jonathan. I think it's probably the same reason we have toenails, is that there are some vestigial remnant of us doing something with our fingernails. I don't quite know what. They do use their toenails to, to kick out vegetation. I've seen them kick out grass and kick at branches that are close to the ground using their toes. But they could quite easily just pull something out of the ground. They don't necessarily use their toenails for that. But quite rightly observed there, they've got five toenails on their front foot and four toenails on their back foot. I suppose from a physiological point of view, um, an elephant's foot doesn't just end like you see it in a bone there. An elephant's foot actually ends in fingers. And although those fingers are now reduced and covered in a fatty layer, 
the toenails are still present, which is interesting because our, toenail, our fingernails and toenails grow from a bed that is almost directly onto the bone, but not attached to the bone. And in this particular case, elephant's particular case, the bone has moved away into the foot, become reduced, and then covered by a fatty deposit. Now, an elephant's foot is very similar to your heel. So for those of you at home sitting well, with the luxury of not having shoes on right now, take your heel and feel it. And you'll see that it's quite, it has, a, it has a, a thick layer of skin with this fatty deposit around your heel bone. Now imagine that just enlarged a little bit and in elephant's front foot having five heel bones and in their back foot having four heel bones, the remnants of their feet and hands as they evolved up through the, through the ages. Wow, this male elephant makes that female elephant look tiny. That's a full-grown female and that huge bull elephant. And he's not the biggest elephant I've ever seen. It's just made her look minute, like a calf. He's just wandering through this herd. Literally just waiting to fend or to defend his, uh, his, um, his case. He's waiting to see if another huge bull elephant joins up. Doesn't look like it's anything to do this afternoon. It doesn't look like he has much to do this afternoon. Duty done, he's seen off other big elephants and uh, he's not quite, or she is not quite ready to ovulate just yet and so it's just a waiting game. You can see him intimidating that youngster there. <laughs> The youngster just making way for him, as is right. It's quite an interesting story about some Kruger National Bull juveniles that were taken to uh, the Pilansberg National Park, which is a little bit closer to Johannesburg than we are now. And because there was a lack of older bull elephants, these youngsters came into their maturity without a capping effect of the older, bigger bulls and became rogue. They would trash property at a regular basis. They were just uncontrollable, basically. They even started to kill other animals. Buffalo and rhino, they started to kill. And what happened was the Pilansberg National Park introduced a bunch of old Kruger National Park bulls to the Pilansberg National Park. And these older bulls effectively capped these youngsters, these rogue youngsters' behavior and brought them back under control again. Isn't that amazing? All right, we've got a vula. Jamie's found him. Off you go. We have indeed found a vula lying right up in the open, completely unexpected. I, I have to confess, I nearly, I nearly drove right past him, and he's not exactly difficult to see. He's not a small leopard. However, he has just decided to reposition himself in a deeper patch of shade. So bear with me one moment as we reposition and get a view of his beautiful face. What a lovely surprise. That was definitely not where I expected to find him. I thought he was going to go south, but I think that's, that's where Sindile went. It was definitely then Sindile that I saw disappearing off. In that case, let's have a look at the lovely Mbula, the leopard with the most amazing eyes. I'm trying to think of a, I've been trying to think of a suitable description for a long time. Oh dear, I have a very large branch underneath my car. I don't think a bull is going to be terribly chuffed with that. Hold on a moment. Let's try and rid ourselves of it. Here we go. Here we go. Should be done. No. Oh no. It's still attached to us. It's okay. We'll just um, We'll keep a slightly wider distance from him and not coat ourselves and him in dust. Here we go. Hi, boy. Dozing sleepily in the afternoon shade. And it is actually a surprisingly hot afternoon. I know that Steph has discussed this already. Surprisingly warm out here for the middle of winter. And Mvula is sleeping off one very full belly, which will also be making him incredibly warm, the digestive processes of these predators tend to create heat more than anything else. 
So there he is, the male leopard known as Mvula, just reaching the age where he is no longer necessarily advertising or trying to hold a territory. He's been largely pushed out by a male called Tingana. But a couple of years ago, in fact a year ago even, Mvula was the undisputed king leopard of Juma and the surrounding areas. He is definitely starting to show some signs of age. He's broken off a canine. His bottom right canine is completely broken. I saw that the last time I was here. And he's starting to get a bit scrappy around the ears. Ah, there are those eyes. But his recent mating exploits with a leopard called Shuluva, as well as his sort of victory over Sindile, although Sindile is not even two yet, it doesn't really entirely count. Mvula still has, I would say, he's a good 20, 30 kilograms heavier than Sindile, which is close to 60 odd pounds. But he has done very well for himself, and he's been sticking around in this area for the last couple of days. He's got a few fresh injuries around his neck, or fresh ish injuries around his neck. We'll have a look at those when he decides to reposition himself. I think he's keeping them flush on the ground. There, you can kind of see whenever he flicks his, <laughs> shame, flicks his face at them. The flies are driving him nuts. Shame, boy. They're probably actually sitting on that injury. Some of them might be biting flies, stable flies. Yes, that's exactly right. Deborah, our armchair traveller, is absolutely right. That is what Mvula's eyes look like to me as well. She said that Mvula's eyes look like there is a light on inside them, like they're shining from below. I think that is a perfect description. I think he has some of the... They're, they're, they're pale blue, which is not unusual in leopards, but his are a colour that I have never seen before. And they must be some of the most extraordinary looking eyes I've ever seen. There we go. He's thinking about opening them. Since, especially since those flies are driving him mad. But I think Deborah's exactly right. There's, there's almost a glow coming from behind them. And I find it very easy to identify him. As soon as he turns those that piercingly blue stare upon you, you immediately know which leopard that you're dealing with. Oh, boy, shame. Those flies driving you nuts. And see sheer irritation there in his body language and that is probably because they're sitting on those injuries and nipping at them which won't be comfortable for him at all Shame. I think he came to the top of the crest here out in the open in the hope that perhaps some of the wind that was blowing earlier would deter them but that hasn't been the case and I don't think that he's going to lie here throughout our afternoon safari. He's very, very close to our northernmost boundary, which means that at some point he might get up and move to the north. Taxon's just taking, checking the Galago, short, uh, the Galago pan for us quickly to check and see whether or not Sindile has popped out there. I'm almost certain that he's going to. He's going to, probably going to go down there and have a drink. But I will check up on the carcass at a later stage to see whether or not he has come back. just wanted to give him some time and some space to relax a bit. Our wild earth girly, talking about the sizes of our various leopards, I said that Mvula is very solid and stocky when compared to poor two-year-old Sindile. However, he is much, much smaller than Tingana and Anderson male. Now, Wild Earth Gurley wanted to know how Mvula compares to the Anderson male. Now, the Anderson male, apparently, I have never seen him, so I actually can't tell you from personal experience, unfortunately. I've never seen him. I have heard stories that he weighs, or he looks as though he weighs up to about 100 kilograms, so 220-odd pounds. That's huge for a male leopard. He's supposed to be one of the largest that the northern Sabi Sands has ever seen. That being said, you know, it's like the fish that somebody caught that gets bigger and bigger with each telling of the story. Um, I think he's huge. I think he is bigger than Tingana, and Tingana, I know from personal experience, is bigger than Mvula. 
but again you're probably looking at a weight difference of about 20 kilograms 44 odd pounds between the two of them the one thing about Mvula is that he's quite short at the shoulder he's stocky he's got a very thick neck but he is to me much shorter than Tingana the Tingana is also one of the largest male leopards I've seen for certainly for a long time The thing that I enjoy so much about Mbula is that he is so utterly relaxed with people around him. Now, uh, there's a wonderful story for those of you who were familiar with Scott and Nikki, who were a presenter, director team, and couple that left us in February. Yes, it was February. And um, there was this wonderful story. Now, Nikki, Nikki had the most for a director. I mean, she, she used to sit and watch the screens, obviously, direct the show. But Nikki also had the most phenomenal instincts in the bush. And she went out with Scott on a game drive in the middle of the day and said to him that she thought she'd seen a leopard. And they then, yeah, I'm not quite sure why she was doubted, but she, they didn't believe her. And they went and checked Buffalzook Dam and walked around there or did whatever they were doing. And then Nikki went back, she said to Scott, I'm just going to go up the, walk up the road and go see what, if I can see any tracks where I thought I saw that leopard. And she was bending down and she looked up and she went to call Scott because she'd found a leopard track. And she said she looked up and five meters away. Now, five meters is close. I'm, again, not sure if it's like the big fish kind of story, but I, I believe her. Five meters away, 15 feet away, was Mvula lying there looking straight into her eyes. Imagine that feeling that she had. We do have some incredibly marvelous experiences. There are those eyes. Those piercing pale eyes. And the, there's the wound, sorry, just before he turns too much. An injury on the, the side of his neck. He's just given us a little bit of a view. And then this light, his eyes look yellow. So interesting. Okay. As, oh, puff of dust. As Mvula goes there, now you can see the light blue. As Mvula goes back to sleep, let us head back across to Steph and his elephants. And these alleys have managed to cross the drainage line in front of us and are standing virtually in the same place they were as you joined the show. Isn't that incredible? You know, from a tracking perspective, if I had to try and re well, solve that just from their footprints, it would have left me dazed and confused, I can tell you. But they've now had a drink. They've spent some time in the drainage line chewing on one or two trees, not really making much of a meal of anything. Then the matriarch must have been the matriarch because she crossed over behind us first and then about 15-20 minutes later the rest of the herd followed in almost her exact footprints and have now moved back into the patch of bush that they were in when we joined and now I can see that they've started to spread out and are feeding again. Just literally picking at the bushes Not doing much. There yeah, they're starting to move off now. That female with her calf at the back of the herd. With the rest of the herd coming into frame now from the left. And spread out now over front probably about 150 to 200 yards or so wide. Now, if you're just joining us, we've been with these elephants for since well since the beginning of the show, which started on, on for our time at three o'clock, and uh, they've had a drink and now they've moved off again. And we were just saying how they had a very quick drink and then moved off to feed, and how much food these elephants are needing to put into themselves on a daily basis to maintain the correct or healthy energy levels. And how difficult that that is at this time of the year, because of the poor nutrition of all the vet, all, of all the bushes that they're eating at the moment. And I would presume that elephants are spending anywhere up to, I'd go so far as to say, hungry elephants will be eating 24 hours a day now, getting little snatches of sleep where and when they can. Now it's not uncommon for elephant to sleep up to 10 hours a night in summertime, but 
For elephants like this that are in the grips of a drought at the end of the dry season or going into the end of the dry season, these elephants will probably be feeding anywhere from about 20 hours to 24 hours a day, depending on where they've been for that day or the previous day, just to maintain healthy energy levels. Isn't that incredible? Eating mostly woody species of plants, so trees, roots, bark and leaves um, at the moment. And, uh, and they're up to about 300 pounds for a female elephant and probably close to 500 or even 600 pounds for a male elephant. Lots of vegetation around at the moment. It looks pretty green and bushy, but as soon as you start to go down to actually what's in the bush, you can have a look around this particular thicket now. You'll see that the, that the bush itself is made up of N nothing almost. In, pl in places where there is supposed to be grass, there's nothing but sand. And you can see that the bushes that you're looking at are all thorny, scraggly trees with very little nutritional value whatsoever. Small leaves, mainly evergreen, and that means, in my opinion, hard and leathery and not very tasty at all. I actually still one or two elephant, can you believe it, in this thicket. That's what makes these elephant herds so dangerous on foot, is you don't quite know exactly where they are. The prime bull, or the big bull elephant that we were having a look at just now, he's, he's still in the thicket off to our right hand side. And what this could only be is then the youngsters, the young males. Donna's made an interesting comment, and Donna, you said you're always amazed at how quiet these elephants are when they're walking through the bush. You're 100% right, Donna. They are one of the quietest animals, and for all their bulk, I promise you, elephant can absolutely drift through the bush like smoke rather than the six-ton behemoths that they are. And all down to their feet, big round dished feet, spread their weight quite evenly and then the bottom of their foot is quite soft. It's horny um, in so much as if you have very cracked heels, the dead skin gets quite calloused or calcified. I don't know how else to put it, but it gets quite hard and like, almost like a horn, like an animal's horn. Um, and that's what the bottom of their foot is like, except that it's malleable, it bends. Very similar to a cracked heel, I would say, is probably the closest analogy that I can give at the moment. And that enables them to feel the bush around them and to walk silently over things. The football hero, you're on a roll today asking me about elephants. And you've just asked me, and nicely so, you've just asked me, what is the average size of elephant herds here in the Kruger National Park? Now, elephant herds in the Kruger Park will vary between about 6 to 12 individuals, with the average about 8. 8 to 10, 12 individuals, all similarly um, uh, related. But they can form agglomerations. You do find sisters that are matriarchs will group together to share a resource, and there you can get elephants numbering up to 100. Can you believe it? The most I've ever seen here in the Kruger National Park was about 120, 130 uh, elephant together. But there are historical events of elephant creating super herds with one another and you get up to a thousand individuals. Isn't that amazing? I think the largest collection of elephant that I've ever seen has been on the Chobe River in October. The Chobe River separates Botswana from, um, from Zambia and there the elephant gather around water which is the resource, the poor resource in that area and there you find, oh, I don't know how many elephant, I would easily say that I saw in one day maybe 20,000 elephant from one vantage point, they look like buffalo, a never-ending sea of elephant from one of the vantage points on the floodplain. Um, and yes, I would say easily, 20, 30,000 elephant. Wow, there's something happening off to our left-hand side. Excuse me for swinging away from you like that, but these elephants just started to scream. And while we're just waiting for the cause of this disruption to make itself clear, Jeffrey has asked, do elephant 
female elephant ever go off on their own? Jeffrey, I've only known female elephants to go off on their own when they're about to give birth. Uh, and then only really, sometimes elephants give birth in amongst uh, the rest of the herd, uh, most of the times in actual fact, but sometimes you find females separating themselves. But they'll always be in contact with the rest of the herd. Um, female elephant or elephants actually can, can contact each other using something called infrasound, which is ultra low frequency sound that they can send out into the bush around them. And in openish areas can be heard up to 10 kilometers away, six miles away. Can you believe it? So even though you might think a female elephant is on her own, she's still in contact with her, with her herd, with her natal herd. Very uncommon for an elephant that's not injured, of course, or sick to be left behind by a herd of elephant. In actual fact, I'm thinking now, it's only really sick or injured or stuck in the mud where I've seen uh, elephants leave family members. And then always it's very distressful for them to do that. You can just see it creates an, a nasty disturbance. All right. And I think on that note, and while we wait for whatever to happen, happen, um, Jamie has got Mvula who's lying nice and flat for you to have a look at. Enjoy him. And we too find ourselves waiting for something to happen and for the moment just stopping to take in and appreciate the beauty that is any sort of leopard. They are just, there's something about them that attracts humans to them. The beauty and the grace and the power that lies beneath the spotted coat of theirs. They are absolutely stunning creatures. Now, while I've been watching Mbula, very sadly now, I've just, I've, I've been through a bit of a search of things today. And I have relocated my beanie, for those of you who were deeply concerned about it. Actually, Louise relocated my beanie for me, looking sad, dirty, and mostly bedraggled. Um, actually, very sad looking. The pom-pom is the saddest thing you've ever seen in your life. It was at the base of the Mahindra, having just had a little bit of a wash. It is now covered in dirt and uh, water. So the beanie is quite safe. I also managed to relocate my lip ice. It's been driven over and in my attempts, you see how close he is to the boundary just by the way. So we are going to have vehicles driving past us the whole time. Oh, how would you like to go on a rescue mission? Because I relocated my lip ice. But it, because it's been driven over, it was really hard to open. So me being me, decided I'm going to try and lever it with my teeth. It's now over there. <laughs> Which is most unfortunate. I can't even show you because it's right next to the vehicle. <laughs> um, so I don't know how, how chapped Mvula's lips are feeling. But if he wants some, there's some lip ice right there on the floor next to him. I might have to do a rescue attempt a little bit later. But it will have to be done by putting... It's not the first time this has happened to me. Almost invariably, actually. It's been things like guest cell phones and mobile phones and cameras that they've dropped off the side of the vehicle in a sighting. And you wind up having to inch the vehicle round to put it between yourself, the animal, between you and the animal, and then bending over and contorting yourself to pick it up. This is the first time I've done that in a long time, and I'm going to have to try and do it at a later stage. <laughs> I'm Mary Edwards on that subject. I'm not going to jump out of the vehicle now and grab it because that would absolutely scare him, Vula. It would be behavior that would be unexpected for him and all of a sudden I would be out of the vehicle and walking around. He would get up and he would run very fast in a general northerly direction. And I say northerly because I'm to the south of him. Now he wants to know actually more specifically whether or not it's dangerous to be out and about on foot, especially around leopards. Um, it depends how you define dangerous. Is it really important to remember that they are wild animals? Yes, absolutely. Are we on their menu? Only in very, very exceptional circumstances. So there are cases where leopards have learned to take people and they have killed people before. However, that is exceptionally unusual and it usually only occurs at night. During the day on foot, we are recognized by everything out here, thanks to thousands of years of evolution, as the apex predator. Now, whilst our Sabi sand leopard have had trackers tracking them pretty much in the same, for the same time period that they've had vehicles around them, so they've got used to people on foot, 
in the way that Mvula is. So if I were to go walking through the bush and I came upon him like this, I could probably watch him from a distance of, I would say, from Mvula, probably comfortably at about 30 meters, which is around 90-odd feet. And that is where I would want to watch him from. And Scott has done that before on foot with Mvula. He sat with him for a considerable period of time and he's perfectly comfortable with it. Sindile, on the other hand, I was in no danger from him. However, he was scared, a little bit scared of me. So he moved off away from me. I don't think he went very far. I think he probably went to go and flop down in the shade, a little bit further away. But that's, that's generally the reaction of leopards. The one thing that leopards do tend to do on foot is, especially ones that are not used to people, is they try and disappear. But they don't necessarily do that by movement because they know, just like we know, that eyes are attracted to movement. So what they do is they go still in a bush. Now when you're on a walk, and this has happened to me once or twice in my life, and I'm sure Steph has had this occur as well, especially around rivers and other such places, if you've encountered a wild leopard before, what they often do is they wait in the hope that you're going to go past them until you get really close to them and they realize that they're going to get spotted, at which point they explode past you. Our leopard moves at about at its fastest, 22 meters per second, or up to 24 meters per second. And you just take a moment to wrap your brain around that. Think about that really carefully and think how fast that is. And actually, I promise you, when that does happen, when you're leading a walk or a group of guests and a leopard comes bounding out of the bushes, you don't even have time to be afraid. You just let it, it it's gone. It's gone before you've even registered what's gone on. You just get a flash or a blur of spots. Occasionally you get a brrrr, and then it's gone. And then your heart rate shoots up, and then it returns to normal once again. I've also had a couple... I had one walk where we didn't have an escape route, and the leopard didn't have an escape route. I just came around the corner, and there it was, hiding in the bushes. And I told... I backed everybody up, but I told them not to look at it. I told them to pretend to just keep looking upwards and to pretend that they hadn't seen it. Because animals are aware. They have to be. All animals are attuned to the position, human beings included. It's why we see faces in things like toasters and microwaves and cars and whatever else we see faces in. Because we're attuned to positioning of eyes and ears and facial expressions. Animals are no different. They take their visual cues from our faces mainly and our body language. So if you pretend that you haven't seen them, occasionally that does work. But no, we are not in danger being on foot out here, as long as we constantly remind ourselves that these are wild animals, and no matter how well we think we know them, we don't ever push it to the point where we put them, make them uncomfortable or ourselves uncomfortable. Sometimes you stumble into something. That is bound to happen. You can imagine, you can't, there's only, just by sheer statistics, there's only so many times you can walk through the bush um, without encountering something before you stumble upon a buffalo or an elephant. And far more dangerous than leopards are things like hippo. Hippo being the most dangerous. Buffalo also can be very aggressive. Um, and elephant. And leopard, in terms of the, the greater scheme of things, I'm talking. Do you mind? don't even know where you are. Oh. Hello, magpie shrikes. have a look at the magpie or the long-tailed shrike. They're the one making a great deal of noise. The shrikes, the shrikes themselves, not including the bush shrikes, but shrikes themselves, are not exactly known for the beauty of their calls. And that sort of harsh grating sound is particularly unpleasant. There you go, thank you. Sorry, didn't mean to insult you. See that little bull snap beforehand? The long-tailed or the magpie shrike. You can see why it's called magpie. Black and white feathers. Oh, and off he goes, having been deeply insulted by my description of its call. Right, well, some say he is the mystic farmer. Others say he speaks the language of the yellow-billed hornbills. However, all we know is that we call him Steph. Let's go find out what he's doing. <laughs> Keep us...
Sometimes I don't know where Jamie gets these things from. All I can say is she's got a very overactive imagination. <laughs> but yeah, we're on our way to, uh, to have a look at Buffelsook Dam and to see what's in the vicinity of the dam. There may not be anything at the water, but there's definitely activity around water sources, as we saw at Voyatilla with those elephant. We expecting something to be around there. I must say, even though I see this on a daily basis, it is astounding to me the depredations of the of the drought and the effect that it's having. I've been lucky enough to be in the Sabi Sands for long enough to have lived through a very, very bad flood and the subsequent wet years leading out of that flood. And that was in the year 2000. And seeing how everything was just it was a thicket. It was a tangle so, so deep you couldn't walk through it. Um, all the way to this, um, which is 16 years later, and we are exactly, exactly a full pendulum away where you could pretty much walk wherever you want to unimpeded and have been able to do so for an entire season now, wet and dry season. It's incredible. It's just nice to sit here and reminisce about the two vastly different experiences that I've managed to have. And with Safari Live being Safari Live, you are going to be able to share that with us as well. Now Kevin, you've asked me an interesting question about the, um, the Transfrontier Parks. And you wanted to know how long has the Kruger National Park been open to Mozambique and have, has it had any effect on the animals there? Uh, Kevin, let me answer this in the way that I can. Um, I can't give you an exact date of when the Transfrontiers border opened. I do know that it was probably in the early 2000s somewhere. I'm, I'm going to leave it at that until I can absolutely uh, confirm what date it was. And as to the effect that it has been having on the animals around there, Mozambique was deprived of animals uh, during an almost 30 year long uh, civil war where people had to live off of the land and were forced to live off of the land due to an incredibly bad civil war there. And what we saw was just this massive reduction in animal populations. And so the Transfrontier Park was to open up the Kruger National Park's abundance or apparent overabundance to Mozambique to allow animal populations to re-establish themselves there. And I'm happy to admit that um, friends of mine who have traveled into that part of Mozambique and close to a dam called the Masingir Dam have said that they've seen multiple sightings of lion, healthy populations of sable, rhinoceros even, elephant, rhino, lion, uh, leopard, cheetah, wild dog. They've seen some some brilliant sightings of that. So it's working, you know, it's re-establishing themselves. And, and quite amazingly, in that, in the 100 years before, in, in 1903, there was a record of a footprint of an elephant in the Kruger National Park. That was the only, and footprint, in the Kruger National Park. That was the only record of elephants in the Kruger National Park. And in 1905, three bull elephant walked across from Mozambique into South Africa, into the Kruger National Park, thereby seeding the current population of elephants. A hundred years later, in a 30-year civil war, South African National Parks, the Kruger National Park, is seeding de deprived areas in Mozambique now. Don't you think it's wonderful? For whatever reason, animals leave, come back, and it's just nice to know that we've got this sort of cycle and we're able to balance these things out. But we're now at Buffalzook Dam, and we don't have much to show, barring a hippo, a terrapin, and a grey heron, and some blacksmith lapwing. And I'm sure the longer I sit here, the list is just sort of going to endlessly grow. But we have got this hippo that's just busy enjoying the solitude of a drying up pan. Now what you're looking at there, that frame that you have there, that is very similar to how I remember the South Luangwa River being, or the South Luangwa National Park on the Luangwa River in Zambia, on the eastern side of Zambia. They have the highest population of hippo 
in this river. They've got 80,000 hippo in this river that runs through this national park. And literally, hippo dot that river in numbers that you can scarcely conceive. And this is how my memory is of it. Very dry. I was there in October in the dry season when the hippo concentrations are at their densest. And now barring the, this puddle, this has only one hippo in it. The puddles in the South Luango would have 10 times this number, 100 times this number. It does remind me strongly of it, this vista. Isn't it wonderful how things can trigger memories. I quite like that. Now there's a terrapin on this hippo's back. Mostly because the terrapin has been in the water around this hippo and has found suitable elevation to climb out of the water and sun itself. It's a cold-blooded reptile which means that it gets its, its metabolism or the rate of its metabolism more correctly from the environment around it and it would be sunning itself now to pick up its metabolism to digest the food that it ate and it's an insectivore so it would have been drawn to the hippo because the hippo with its defecating and stirring up the mud would stir up any invertebrates that you find in the mud around this particular hippo and that the terrapin would have been enjoying and so the terrapin would have been drawn to the hippo for the disturbance it has to the environment around it kicking up any insects the insects are then fed upon by the terrapin and when he's cold and full enough he would have climbed onto the closest elevated position sitting in the sun increasing his body temperature increasing his metabolism and digesting what's in his belly interesting huh? Cameron, you are seven and it's your birthday today and you have asked for a big bird for your birthday present. There you got it. Firstly, I want to say happy birthday. That's rightly deserved. Hey, and from all of us here at Wild Earth, I'm sure we are celebrating, or well, we will be celebrating with you with a little bit later. We'll cheers you with a glass of apple juice over the fire. But there you have a big bird. That bird is probably about as tall as what you are, Cameron, when it stands to its full height. So if you go stand against the wall and you stretch yourself out against the wall and put your hands on top of your head and then you walk away and you have a look at how tall that is from the floor to your hand, that is exactly how tall that bird is, the grey heron. Quite a common bird around these watering points. It has a black-headed heron as a cousin that only you find only in grasslands, this particular heron only enjoys the wetter marshy areas where it hunts for frogs and snakes and other reptiles. You also asked me, Cameron, for a snake. They are tough to find this time of the year, unfortunately, and that's because they're all going through a little bit of a sleep, not quite a hibernation, not quite an estivation, but they're going through a bit of a, a lull in their activity, and it's restricted almost solely to the hottest parts of the day in the middle of the day. And by now, they would have long ago be in their hidey places for the evening. And so quite tough to find. On foot, it might have been a little bit easier, but with me in a car, difficult. But I'm glad we at least managed to get one of your, one of your, uh, your wishes. So from me, at least to you, happy birthday. Let's go a little bit closer there to the, that end of the pan over there. There's a few birds that are winging it in to have a drink. And it seems to be... The, the place to be, actually. Now, it's funny, birds are drawn to other birds. You find bird parties around. And I think what happens at the watering points, bird fi birds find comfort in numbers and will quite often be drawn to where there are other birds to go and have a drink. And I think that's what's happening here. It would be good for us to sit here for a few minutes and to see what else comes in. the moment we've just got a blacksmith lapwing and a cape turtle dove let's show you what they look like that is the blacksmith lapwing the black and white bird and the cape turtle dove now while we are waiting for more birds to come winging into uh, this particular drinking spot 
I'm going to send you over to Jamie and that beautiful cat in Vula. Our beautiful and very sleepy Mvula. He hasn't moved very much at all. He's found himself a perfectly comfortable spot. And now that the wind has picked up ever so slightly, you can see the leaves rustling in the background there. He seems to no longer have quite the fly problem that he did initially. He's definitely <coughs> come to the right spot in terms of escaping them. He sent a few of them to me, actually. I don't know how Dave's doing, but I've just had about five try to fly up my nose. That's okay. Entirely worth it just to be close to this particular cat. And he just gave us another demonstration of why we love Mbula so much and just how relaxed he truly is. Because he let me reverse back, pick up my dropped lip ice, and climb, not, I didn't get out of the car, but I did do some leaning out of the car. And he didn't lift, did he lift his head, Dave? Nope. No, didn't even lift his head up at us. A truly special animal. That is why the Sabi Sand is one of the most special places to come and to view the big cats. They have come to live almost completely unfazed by the presence of human beings in vehicles and as I said most of them are actually absolutely fine with us on foot as well and it helps of course that he's got a very full belly and is feeling thoroughly comfortable stretched right out now if I, to give you an idea as to the length of a leopard from his head to his tail if I were to go and lie down next to him well. I mean, if he were, he's not quite that tolerant, and I'm certainly not going to go and do it. But if I were to go and lie down next to him at my five foot seven inches length, he would probably be a good, I would say, a good foot longer if I stretched out right next to him, including his tail, of course. Oh, they're incredibly long and heavy tail. I've been fortunate enough to deal with sedated leopards before. And that tail is very, very heavy, as I said. It's heavier than it looks. And it serves a very important purpose in terms of, first of all, conveying the mood of a leopard. And then secondly, acting as a essentially a balancing rod whenever they are climbing up in the trees or when they're chasing something. But mainly for tree climbing. And then, of course, we've got his fluffy rosetted coat. The solid spots on his belly and then the rosettes around his side and around his bottom. And that, of course, is completely unique, that pattern of spots to Mvula. There you can see thick belly fur. It is winter, so they do grow a slightly thicker undercoat to keep themselves warm on the chilly nights. Beautiful view of his foot. Oh! <laughs> There you go, there's a hole in his paw. Not a big one, but there's a slight hole in the toe there. I'm not sure, that could, that could be from anything. It's not too deep, it hasn't broken through the very, very thick skin of the bottom of his foot. There is a slight dent there that might even be visible in his track <clears throat> if one were to stop and to look closely enough. The flies seem to be targeting that as well. That might have been from the fight that he had, but we're not a hundred percent certain. Now, Jeffrey in Texas, it's fantastic to have you on the Sunset Safari. Now, Jeffrey is wondering a little bit about. Oh, sorry, this is Jeffrey in Durban, not Jeffrey in Texas. Different Jeffrey. Sorry, Jeffrey. Jeffrey in Durban, so a local, a South African local. Now, Jeffrey's actually wondering about how endangered leopards actually are in South Africa because we get a lot of publicity about lions but less so about leopards. Well, Jeffrey, in South Africa, we're actually relatively fortunate in certain areas in that the leopards don't fall under the endangered category. In fact, in parts of South, in South Africa itself, they don't even fall under what's known as the vulnerable category um, under the ICUN Red List. That being said, there is a lot of rhetoric from certain parties that have an interest in claiming that there are more leopards than there are. 
And it basically said that there's lots and lots of leopards in South Africa. We just don't see them. And whilst that may be the case, there's a huge project that is underway from Panthera because we actually don't know how many leopards there truly are throughout the country and especially in the low felt because again unless you're in the Sabi sand where we keep track of each and every single leopard they, we hear about them in places like in Pretoria in abandoned council buildings we hear about them in under the Ellis Park Stadium we know that they're around Michalisburg the mountain range around Michalisburg yet we don't really have a concept of just how many leopards there are and Panthera has launched an enormous project starting off small but it will expand further and further which involves putting up camera traps because that's basically the only way to go about monitoring leopards because if a skittish leopard isn't used to people and doesn't want to be seen unless you invest hours and days and months into relaxing that particular leopard you're never going to know it's there if it doesn't want to be seen you won't find it so the, the camera traps the motion sensing um, cameras what they do is they have very very advanced software that's kind of like facial recognition software but is based on spots and it will sift through each and every picture that the camera traps, and I'm talking hundreds of camera traps, have taken and start to come to a conclusion as to just how many leopards there are. Uh, an example of this was a reserve of 25,000 hectares that I used to work on. I had no idea how many leopards there were, just because we never saw them. They were so skittish. And they were very, very hard to track because this place, unlike the Sabi sand, which is quite a lot of sand, um, it was mainly rocks. So you could it, tracking them was very difficult. So we put camera traps up, 100 in 25,000 hectares, one on each side of a suitable spot, and ended up with a conclusion there were 12 permanent based, 25 um, moving, 25 in total. So the ones with their sort of territory on the fringes or nomadic leopards. And that was the conclusion in just 25,000 hectares. And what they're using that for is to be able to turn around and go to certain organizations and I don't need to mention which ones they are, but to go around certain organizations and say there are less leopards than you think there are, we need to start protecting them. The Cape leopard is endangered. So it's, there's a lot of argument as to whether or not it's called a subspecies, but we do know that there are very, very few Cape leopards around in that area. Now they're, not, they're not endangered and they're not vulnerable just yet throughout the world. Yes, absolutely. Throughout Africa, if you take an average of the population, absolutely. They are, of course, as always, because they're something so beautiful. Naturally, there are certain sectors of the population that want a leopard, a leopard pelt. Something I find incomprehensible, but that does happen, as well as all of their medicinal properties and certain traditional beliefs, because nothing says I've become a man like hunting a leopard. It is something that is very sad. Luckily, there are lots of places like the Sabi Sand, and fortunately for them and for us, leopards are very, very good at keeping themselves secret and safe. Football man, while we look at Mvula's beautiful face, you wanted an explanation behind the different male and female spot patterns. Well, football man, first of all, there's no major difference between male and female in terms of their spot patterns. There's two ways you can go about identifying leopards. First of all is to just con look at the sort of the notable spots on their face. As I said, it is completely unique. However, the more traditional way, hold on one moment, Taxon's calling me, and this is a bit of a complex explanation, so just bear with me. Uh, standing by. Uh, Tax, I think he twitched his ear once, but yes, otherwise. <laughs> Copy that will do. I might go back and check that bumper just in a few moments, just to see if that young daughter's come back. <laughs> Taxon wanted to know whether or not um, Mvula was still flat. And you heard, naturally, of course, you heard my response. Sorry, football man, I apology, apologize for the interruption. I thought Tax might be calling me to tell me that he'd located Sandile, but he just wanted to know whether or not Mvula was moving. Um, so the spot pattern, the traditional way in the Sabi sand and most research organizations is to look, there we go, at the top row of spots 
on a less around a leopard's whiskers. So there you can see. Look closely. Oh, beautiful eye. And gone again. See where he's got the white whiskers sticking out of his face. Now go upwards towards his eye. There's a three spots in a row there. And those are the whisker spots that are used to identify them. Now, in both males and females, the leopards can either have two spots there, three or four. And taken from right to left, they are therefore known as a, for example, a 4-4 four, four female, or a 3-4 female, or a 4-3 male. It will differ from their right side to their left side, and that is the way that we go about having a look at or identifying them. Then from there, it's because, of course, there's a limited number of combinations you can have, and naturally you might end up with two, three, three males in a, an area close to each other. Well, if that happens, then they are usually named after the area that they're in. So if you get to that point and you've got two leopards with identical spot patterns, then you look a little bit further afield and you start looking at their other identifying features. Look at Mvula's ears. Sorry, before we go too far away. Look at his ears. You can see the nicks and cuts there. Those will be with him throughout his life. Although you've got to be careful with something like that because that changes. So that he might add, he might get an extra nick. That nick might get deeper. It won't heal up completely, he'll always have them. You can see the flies are driving him crazy. So that is the way in which leopard spot patterns work. And <laughs> look at Mvula dozing away. We're going to play a little bit more of the patience game and decide whether or not we want to stick with Mvula or move off. I might go and check the kill and then come back here. While we do that, let us find out how Steph is going on Wounded Wendy. <laughs> Believe me, I can empathize with Mvula and those flies. They have, I have a similar effect on flies and I absolutely detest them to the point of distraction and much anger, really. But yeah, Wendy seems to be, um, she seems to be a bit sick. She's got a slip on her clutch, which is a bit worrying. But she's still able to drive. She's not smelling like she's, uh, she's dying. So I'm sure it's just a setting on a cable or some or other something somewhere. Full respect to her and all the kilometers that she's managed to do over the last couple of years. 30 years in actual fact, there and thereabouts. And, uh, you know, these things happen. So not too bad. We're on our way back now to, uh, to the DRC where we're going to get that magician Opa to have a look at, at her. Well, while we do, we're just sort of ambling down Central Road, which for me is actually quite a nice road, I'll be honest with you. It, it travels through one of the most botanically rich areas on Juma. This is exactly where that is. And this area is special for me, only because I know what lies off the road. And it's one of the areas with the most drainage lines. I know Brent also loves this particular road for that reason. And inside these drainage lines, you find the most unbelievably diverse uh, speciation or uh, diversity of tree species here. And the, I counted in January, um, we were doing about 10 species per hectare here, which is a lot. A hectare is 100 meters by 100 meters, so sort of 100 and something odd yards by 100 and something odd yards. That's a hectare. So not a lot of ground. We were doing 10 large species of trees in that particular area, and I'm sure if we had taken our time, we could have done a lot more than that as well. So of course, because of all those trees, you get a lot of birds and a lot of animals that come and utilize the trees for food and for shelter. and. Uh, and of course, it's just got this energy to it, something that I quite enjoy. The Birmingham boys also love this particular portion of, uh, of Juma, although they tend to be always moving through it rather than spending time on it, but nonetheless. Ah, 
James Richards has asked, as usual, one of these really deep questions, James, and I, I thank you for those because it st stretches my frontal lobe out. You've asked which trees are most susceptible to, I suppose, diseases would be it, uh, or parasites would be another one. Now, James, I think all trees are, are susceptible to parasites equally, to be quite honest with you. It's how they deal with those parasites that is in question. And some trees seem to be host to more parasites than others. And I would be honest that I see mistletoe in knob thorns here um, quite prevalent. But as soon as you leave the Kruger National Park, mistletoe starts to attack other plants. Although you find some mistletoes here uh, growing so ma so badly over a knob thorn that they actually kill it in the end, it's definitely not a common thing. But you do see a lot of mistletoe on knob thorns. Um, more knob thorns than anything else. I would say that that's probably your most um, susceptible to parasitic organism. And then I would think that, oh, let me think now. Trees look the healthiest out here. Um, I don't think there is. I would just say that, I, I would go so far as to say that there's a tree that looks like it gets affected the most and that all other trees are sort of equal in their ability to fend themselves off of, uh, oh, here we're going to have a problem. Oh, no. Come on, girl, you can do it. No. All right, so we run out of clutch there, which is not too much of a problem. We just need to look for level roads on the way back to the DRC or a little bit more speed, I think, is needed. Let's see if we try the speed one first and see if we can... Uh, we can get up. Please excuse me rubbing my face non-stop while I'm busy speaking to you. I'm in the grips of a bit of the cold. Okay, let's see if we can get some speed now. Build up some momentum. Let's see if I'm going to second gear and make it. Come on girl. Yes, no, we're going to stop probably in exactly the same place as we did before. <laughs> Alright, so the round route back it is. Let's see what we can do around this side. If we can even get out of this little depression. Might prove that this is where Opa is going to be finding us. Let's see. Come on. Oh, yes, you can do it. There we go. And then we have a Nyala to reward us for all our hard work. A beautiful, mature Nyala bull standing in the late afternoon sunset here, or the sunset light that we've got. He's now obviously moving off because I would like to show him to you and into the sun. Get a quick silhouette of him. Hopefully, he comes out from behind that bush. No? <laughs> Just my luck. Let's see if we can get him there without the sun blinding you. There you go. Oh, he is magnificent. Look at those ivory tips on his horns. They are parallel to one another, those ivory tips, which shows me, there you go, you can see how parallel they are. Not pointing away from each other and not pointing towards each other. And that tells me that he is a prime male. He is in his prime. He is the type of male that will be siring the majority of the youngsters. Uh, if he didn't do so this year, he will do so next year. Beautiful example of a male Nyala ram. Just to say thank you for treating Wendy so well on the way back up that hill. So Mohammed, all the way from Doha, has made an interesting observation in that our vehicles are open and unprotected and he's seen pictures or been to the Kruger National Park where vehicles are closed and is wondering to know is there any particular reason for that? I mean, is there a safety aspect to that? Uh, Mohammed, to be honest with you, the reason why they have closed vehicle restrictions in the park is because the majority of the tourists that go and visit there have little to no experience in the bush and it's literally just a safety consideration rather than a must. 
Um, and it's to keep the occupants in the vehicle, keep their arms safe and, you know, limit the amount of things that can be thrown at animals to gain their attention and uh, create photo opportunities just from people that have no experience. The more experience you have, the more used to animals you get and the, your ability to read them, then this becomes less need or it becomes less apparent. And it's granted to the vehicles inside the, the parks, the, the restricted parks like we're in at the moment, to have a more open vehicle, a more open safari vehicle. And uh, basically, that is the story behind it. There's no real difference between Kruger National Park's animals' reaction to cars here or in the public areas of the park. It's literally how cars behave towards animals. You know, quite often people will click their fingers to get a lion to sit up to take a nice photograph and that's almost the worst thing you can do is draw attention to your hand doing these crazy things or bang the car door if an elephant gets too close uh, or vice versa, you want to attract the elephant's attention. And those are, of course, activities that are frowned upon. We try not to have uh, reactions on animals as much as is possible. You know, it's not always possible out here. We do, we do live here the same as these animals. It's our home as much as it is theirs. And so interactions are inevitable, which was actually the point I was trying to make with that comment, in that it's, it's inevitable to, ha to not have in interactions with animals. And what we try and do is try and limit our negative effect, I suppose, is the better way of explaining what we try and do and not do. We've got some birds giving an alarm call here. I'm wondering if there isn't an owl or a snake here for young Cameron to have a look at. Let's see what we've got. So you might be able to hear in a second or two a twittering or a chittering in this particular tree. And that's because there's birds alarm calling and there's more than one species of bird that's alarm calling in this particular tree. And that's absolutely a sign that there's a predator of some sort in this tree. Now it could be a, an owl, that's what I'm predicting it to be, but it could also easily be a snake. Now nothing's immediately apparent, so it's not a big bird or a big owl, which is tending me towards it being either a small owlet or a uh, or some type of snake. Now the key would be to actually find out exactly where these birds are making their noise. And I think what's going to have to happen is we're going to have to go around to the other side of this particular tree and see where they are chittering from. Now definitely more than one species. I see a chin spot batis, I've seen a grey-headed bushrike and I've, I hear some of these other canaries and things going crazy here. Excuse me not making eye contact with you as much as what I usually do, but I'm just trying to get exactly where these birds are making their noise from. In actual fact, as we speak, they've stopped. They're still in there, in that bush. Definitely not that excited chittering that we were hearing a bit earlier. So if it was a snake, it would seem that the snake's gone into a hole perhaps with our approach. Snakes are quite sensitive to that sort of thing. If they had seen something like us approaching, they would have moved off into a hole. And because of that, the birds have now decided to, basically to, uh, to de-escalate their reaction to that particular animal. So let's say I think it was probably a snake that has gone into a hole because I didn't see any owl or other bird fly away. And that was the riddle. Well, it still is a riddle, but that is my answer to the riddle in any case. But on that note, we um, are going to make our way back, trying to keep to the flat areas as much as possible. And uh, we're going to send you over to Jamie and, uh, and Mvula. Steph, 
trying to make his way back to camp on limping Wendy. No, no, wounded Wendy works better as a description. We are still with Mvula, who, as you can see, has been incredibly active. I'm going to put forward a proposal to all of you, and as you know, democracy rules. Oh, hold on. Mm, just, just the flies stressing him out a little bit. I'm going to put forward a proposal, which is, we'll stay here for a few more minutes. Would you guys like to stay, or would you like to leave? Go and have a look back at the kill, and then return to the site. And you can send through those answers on hashtag Safari Live on Twitter, or you can email through on questions at wildearth.tv. Let's see what we decide to do. I will say, if we go... I cannot guarantee that he will still be here when we get back. It is starting to get a bit cooler, so he may decide to move off and go and search for some water, potentially. And if he does do that, it may mean that he disappears into Buffles Hook. Or he may decide to go back to the kill. At the moment, though, I think that is relatively unlikely. Now, while we were sitting here, Dave and myself saw something amazing pop itself out of the tree and I'm sort of hoping that he might decide to come back out once again. Now, off to the east of me is a tree with a perfect hiding place. Now, Steph was talking about the potential of it being a snake upsetting the birds. We saw a lizard pop out of... Oh, sorry. <laughs> it was me leaning on the box pop out of this crack in the bark over there and he was basking in the sun unfortunately it was I spotted him just as another vehicle pulled up and he disappeared back into his hole but hopefully our Agama decides to come back out and we'll be able to show you him I've been looking for a picture of him in my book but I'm struggling for some silly reason I'm being very silly Somewhere in here, there's a, I know there's a nice picture. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> At least you've got a, a beautiful leopard to keep you entertained while I page through and try and find the picture of the lizard that I just saw. Okie dokie. Well, it seems as though we have a vote coming through, and as always, democracy counts. So what we will do is you'll come on a journey with me off-road, and you'll get to see just how complex it is negotiating that particular spot. We'll go and have a look at the kill, and then we will return to Mvula. Just by the way, the mating lions that were on the property this morning have actually moved off. They were chased by elephants. And it seems as though they have headed across into Buffles Hook around Sydney's Dam. All right, let's go off. Let's head across and see whether or not Sindile has decided to put, go to the kill. If he hasn't, we'll come back out, we'll go check the water, and then we'll come back here again. Let us go and investigate. Cheers, guys. Bula. We'll be back to see him later, hopefully, unless he moves off. The nice thing is that Ephraim is here, so he will be able to keep an eye on him for us while we're gone. All right, let's go and investigate the kill. Our stations, I'm leaving Bula lying flat cat close to Buffles at Cut Line with Ephraim on lock, space for two. Yoki, let us go. You ready for this, Dave? Oh, yes. Dave and I have done this road many times. We've been down this road many times before. It's starting to become a little bit of a road, actually. Okay. Oh, I never shut my door after I, after I, that would have been fun. Can you imagine tumbling down, leaning on the door and tumbling into the drainage line? <laughs> That would have been very entertaining for everyone concerned except me. That was when I went and rescued my lip eyes. I didn't want to frighten Mbula by slamming the door, so I just left it open. Ah, oh, that would have been terribly entertaining. 
Okay, I, there is a good chance that Sindile is going to be around. And the reason I say that is because he's been in captivity for so long and because he is so young, whilst he is a proficient, he's, he's clearly shown that he is capable of surviving, I think a lot of his survival has been based on scavenging, picking up carcasses. And leopards do all leopards scavenge regularly, more so than we might expect them to. But I think especially for Sindile, a great deal of his meals, well done Dave, have been acquired through picking up scraps of other predators' meals. So there's a good chance he's not going to pass up, even though there's very little food left on this carcass, it's a good chance he's not going to pass up the opportunity to feed off it some more, especially with Mvula being all the way over there. Okie dokie. Let's take this path of different routes into this particular spot. While we do this, Gail was wondering about the way in which Sindile was quarantined when he was in captivity and how they managed to keep him from becoming too used to humans. And obviously we saw now when I went to try and find him again just how skittish he has become, which is, as I said, a really, really good thing. Now, Gail, what they would have done, I, I, I didn't visit the enclosure, obviously, but what they would have done in the time that he was quarantined was they would have put him in a enclosure that what we call a boma, but essentially a fenced area, and they would have put shade cloth all around the side in order to prevent him from becoming used to the idea of people, and cert most importantly, associating people with food. Now, either they would have to feed him, either they would have turfed the kills over the wall without him realizing that there were people there, so just throwing them over, whatever they happened to feed him off, or they would have had a cage-like system that could have been closed off from view, so they would have put the food inside there and then opened up the door without him ever associating the food with human beings. And that is really, really important. Because if they hadn't done that in the way that they have, and they clearly have done it very well, let's just check carefully here while we go along. They've clearly done it well because he is nervous of people on foot, which is a good thing. The last thing you want is a leopard that has, oh, he's there. Yay! Hey, what wonderful news. Yay. Okay, I think we're going to find a nicer position this way. Or, we're going to have to try and go around the other side. <laughs> oh, goodness gracious. Hello, Sindile. I'm glad to see you still here. Um, yes, a leopard that has come back from captivity with no fear of humans is a very, very dangerous creature. Hello. That is, oh, it is him. For one second there, I didn't see the collar, and I thought perhaps we had a different leopard, and I was about to be aghast at the drama that this particular Tamburti tree has seen. But nope, that is our Sindile. The name that means survivor, and a leopard that has been through so much over the last few months. Let me explain the situation as quickly as possible for new viewers, because we do have new viewers jumping on board with us every single drive. The reason that this leopard has that big collar around his neck is because about a year ago, during one of our live safaris, we were called in to Sindile. Brent actually was called in to a sighting of Sindile. He was just a year old and he had made a kill, probably, or almost made a kill, probably the biggest thing that he had ever caught. Unfortunately for him, it was a stray dog that had wandered in from the townships or the surrounding villages on the outskirts of the reserve. Now, what happens with dogs in that situation is when they do come into reserves, you can almost guarantee that they are rabid because otherwise they don't leave the shelter of the villagers, but they become disoriented and confused. Very sadly, that dog tested positive for rabies and thus the authorities were left with a very, very difficult decision. Sindile was captured 
and given a series of vaccinations during his eight months in quarantine and then released at around 20 months old back into the wild once again. That happened at the beginning of May. Now that collar is around his neck in order to keep track of his movements. It looks tight, I promise you it isn't. It is geared towards dropping off as he grows older and once it does reach the point where it is, it, it's time for it to drop off. So it will drop off when it is too tight. However, a too loose collar is far more dangerous. A loose collar is far more dangerous than a tight collar because what happens is the animals catch themselves on branches and sticks, especially an animal like a leopard that spends its life climbing up and down trees. And obviously this has been fitted and carried out by experts who essentially have saved Sindide's life. Years ago, if a leopard had been seen with a dog, he would have, by law in the country, he would have been killed. So Sindile, our little survivor, has proved to be an incredible leopard. He wandered around after he was released. He tried to reunite with his mom, Shadow. Unfortunately, his mom, Shadow, had a bra has a brand new cub, and she was not having any of it. And so... Sindile wanders around scavenging off kills, although we still, Herbert is convinced that he made this impala kill and that he was sharing it with the leopard that we have just been with a moment ago. They had a bit of a scrap this morning, lots of sound and fury, but actually it was relatively harmless. Yay! I'm glad that he's here and that he hasn't gone too far away. Is there a more iconic image than a leopard sprawled across the protective boughs of a tambuichi tree? Not that this is the most comfortable looking tree in the world, but it is a beautiful image nonetheless. I thought about going around to the other side of the bank. First of all, that's going to take me a long time, and second of all, I actually think our view would be totally obscured by the branches of that particular tree. So I think we'll stick with our view for now. It's a pity we can't see his face, but he might not stay in that position the entire time. Our station's this young Madora is now back in a shlashla. Robin Lee, a random question while we watch our young leopard with his impala dinner. Now, Robin Lee, aloha to you too from Hawaii. Robin wanted to know what foods we miss the most when we are out in the bush. Now, we, of course, at Wild Earth are incredibly fortunate in that we have the lovely Amanda and, at the moment, Tundi taking care of us and cooking for us, and we can't complain. I miss sushi. I really do. It's one of the first things I do when I get back into a city. I eat sushi and I often will eat Chinese food as well. Those are usually my first two things that I go and grab. Dave? Pizza. Pizza? Oh yes, by the way, Jerry's gone into Hoodsprate and um, Jerry will be bringing me back takeaway pizza for tonight. <laughs> I'm very, very excited. So Dave says he misses pizza. Dave, you can have a couple of slices of mine. Thanks, Jeremy. It's a pleasure. Can I read you? Yes, of course you can. <laughs> Trust me, I wouldn't have offered if I didn't mean it. I don't part with my food easily. A little bit like Mvula and Sindile. <laughs> Those, that's generally, you'll find for us, we, we miss fast food, which is ridiculous. Um, not all of us. James, of course, would, I never think, never let such an unhealthy thing pass his lips. Oh, big stretch there from Sindile. Looks as though he's about to fall out of the tree. He won't though. It's the one thing he has mastered. But when he was a cub we used to watch him fall out of trees all the time. He was such an incredible leopard when he was little. He was always up to something naughty and entertaining. Hunting buffalo, which of course he'd never been able to hunt. Waterbuck again too big. He'd climb a tree and fall out of it. He'd jump on mom. 
He was just all round thoroughly entertaining. He's also, when you do get to see him, very beautiful. Young male leopards really are stunning. But at the moment, he is not playing along. What else do I miss in terms of food? My mom's curry, I think, is one of them. And we have a viewer called Sick198, the 198th uh, Sick username. Sick198, have we ever witnessed odd or unusual behavior from an animal? Sure. Yes, all the time. Although I suppose it depends on what you describe as odd or unusual. So, the animals, as we've always said, don't read the textbooks. They do what they want and it's usually up to us to try and interpret or look for an explanation behind their behavior. For example, I had a female elephant pin a young bull to the ground and I have absolutely no idea to this day what her problem was or what he did wrong. There was something that happened there, but it, that might not have been odd behavior. It's just that I don't have an explanation for it. This is going to be beautiful. Dave is being artistic. Dave, of course, is very artistic, so he's providing us with a beautiful view of the setting sun. The good news, of course, is that we can actually, now that the kill is up in the tree, as is Sindile, we can stay here and spotlight them, which we couldn't do yesterday because the kill was on the ground. So we didn't want to run the risk of them having it stolen by our hyena clan. Odd and unusual behavior is a different one, difficult one because our understanding of the animals out here is always broadening. So what we think is odd and unusual is just perhaps we haven't seen or found an explanation behind it. Aggressive animals, and I say use aggressive very, very reluctantly, there's usually a reason behind it. Either they've been pushed, they've got bad memories associated with vehicles, they've got, in elephant's case, a tooth abscess which is hurting them. This scenario, though, um, to SICK 182, I think it was. Was it 182 or 180? I think it was 182. Well, well whatever. Um, <laughs> sorry, my number memory has gone away. Uh, this situation is truly incredible. This is very, very unusual. To see the, the scenario, I have never, ever followed a story where a leopard has, of Sindile's age, has been removed from the wild then put back in the wild, during which time his mother has had another cub. He's encountered a previously dominant male, in the case of Mvula, who may or may not be his father. It's unlikely, but it's entirely possible. Never discount that possibility. It could be his father that he was sharing the kill with. Um, and you've got a case of two leopards that don't really want to risk serious injury to each other, so I think Brent described it as a gentleman's agreement. I'm not quite sure young Sindile qualifies as a gentleman just yet. He's not even quite an adult just yet. But he has certainly proved his skills and survival abilities. And right now, much like Mvula, proving just how good leopards are at sleeping. And the lions take the gold medal for Olympic sleeping ability, but leopards come in at a very close second when they have full bellies like this. I'm glad to see that he did make his way back to the kill. He was quite the surprise when I went for a little bit of a walk, though he's obviously trekked all the way back up the drainage line and back up into the tree. And woe is Wendy, wounded Wendy, still being examined closely by Opa. No wonder she tried to turf Brent into the drainage line this morning. A major clutch problem. <laughs> that was <laughs> apparently a very interesting moment. I actually still haven't watched it. But uh, Wendy this morning, on this very steep embankment that we currently find ourselves on, 
except on the other side of the drainage line. Wendy attempted to roll forward from where we enter on that side. You can sort of see the two tracks there on the right of the termite mound. That's where we drive in on that side. And Wendy apparently attempted to send both Brent and Gert careering into a very steep drainage line. And as Brent said, if, they had, if that hadn't happened, they would have actually hit the Tamburti tree that had two leopards in it. Neither of which would have, neither, <laughs> neither scenario would have been ideal. Let's put it that way. I believe that Brent got quite the surprise. While we watch our lovely leopard snooze his evening away, we've gone from one flat leopard to another flat leopard, just one on the ground, one in the tree. Arcadia would like to know if I could have anyone living or dead on the back of the vehicle, who would it be? Do I only get one option? Do I only get one choice? Um, Arcadia, I have an easy answer to that. Um, I have an answer. But it's a difficult one because there's so many great figures of history that I would love to, for them to be able to experience moments like this. But Arcadia, my answer has to be, I would really, really have loved to have been able to take my, my grandfather out on a game drive. My grandfather spent most of his adult life wandering around this area, working as a game warden, um, Working as a as a mining consultant, I don't I don't really a hundred percent know what he was doing. Most of the time, he was just wandering around looking for Paul Kruger's millions. But um, he raised a lion cub before she got too big, and he had to put her uh, had to have her released. Um, he he absolutely loved the bush, and I think that's where my love of the bush came from. And unfortunately, by the time I qualified as a guide, he was already sort of at the point where he is very. It was very difficult to travel with him, obviously, age starting to take its toll. And he has unfortunately since then passed away. But I would really, I think it would have made his day. He kind of knew what I was doing um, towards the end, but he wasn't fully aware of exactly what was going on. And I really would have loved to have been able to, as my memories of him from being a little girl, I would have loved to have taken him out on a game drive. I think that would have been really, truly special. Perhaps wherever he is, he is watching us. Looking down upon Sindile and Mvula and all of our different characters. And correcting everybody else's grammar. And writing lovely poems, which he used to love to do. And draw, drawing pictures of the animals. Or walking his dogs, his many, many out-of-control dogs that resulted in many, many knee injuries throughout his life, teaching them to chase monkeys. Oh dear. Poor Wendy. Wendy's down. Wendy is down and out for the count. It looks as though perhaps Steph may not be back once again out on our safari. Which is most unfortunate and it does tell us that the vehicle problem was considerably worse than Brent realized when he went off this morning. And of course being off on a very, very exciting venture which we will talk a little bit more of towards the end of the sunset safari. Fortunately, we have this marvelously active leopard in front of us, doing all kinds of things to keep us entertained. <laughs> Giving us a slight glimpse of a canine tooth and twitching ears. And Dina, good point, just speaking a bit about, I touched on this, but I didn't really go into it. Speaking about how we would refer to Sindile at nearly two years old, He's, I wonder if he's dreaming. It doesn't look like it's movement in response to flies. Twitching his whiskers around. 
But good point. Is he classified as an adult or a sub-adult? Um, that's always a point at which there's some disagreement in terms of the classification of animals and where exactly they turn from a sub-adult to an adult. In my opinion, um, I would I would still call him a sub-adult, to be 100% honest with you. If it were a normal situation, he would be co almost completely independent from mom. And sorry, bear with me. I'm cold now that the sun has disappeared below the horizon, as is Dave. Apparently, he's also feeling a little bit chilly. So while we shuffle our jackets on, I would think of him as a sub-adult, just because at this age, normally, under normal situations, a male leopard would not have gone terribly far away from mommy. They'd be hanging around her natal range still, and still paying a visit to her every now and again. I would say that at about two and a half, that is where I would absolutely classify an, a, a male as an adult. The weird thing is with leopards, of course, is that the females become independent far quicker than the males do from their mothers, and they actually move off on their own far sooner. And so I wonder if you would move forward the classification. I don't know. I mean, it's, a, it's nothing that has ever been formalized in terms of the way in which I refer to them. I, I still think of, but maybe that's just because we missed out on eight months of his life that I still think of a Sindile as a sub-adult. A sub-adult isn't necessarily even an official term in certain circles. Oh, hello, boy. Hello, boy. Oh, back to sleep. That look very clearly seemed to convey, I'm an adult, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> and I suppose perhaps we should give him credit where credit is due. He's done a marvellous... Oh, careful. Hold on one second. I just need to contact tax. Careful, Cindyla. You're going to fall out of that tree. Yep, up he goes. I'm waiting for my opportunity to have this conversation. Currently conversation occurring. Ooh, here we go. Is this it? Nope. No, it's not. Almost. I can hear tax and leaving. Come on, come on, let me talk, let me talk, please. Tax, tax. You've got to be quick off the mark with this radio. Uh, this young, my daughter's back here. No, oh, okay, fair enough. That's fine with me. We will have our sighting of Sindile all to ourselves. Apparently, just by the way, an update on Vula, he is still fast asleep where we left him. You can see the rapid breathing from Sindile. Rapid rise and fall of his chest. It's because he's digesting. So, first of all, as I said with Mvula, that process is making him very warm. Second of all, <laughs> shame he really can't find a comfortable spot. <laughs> even even with a leopard's gift for making an uncomfortable spot look comfortable, he does not look comfortable. Constantly shifting. Yes, the digestion, digestion of all of that meat, producing lots of heat, and also such a full belly, pushes up against the diaphragm itself, reducing the lung capacity a little bit. And he's lying on his belly, which makes things even more uncomfortable. How absolutely 100% remarkable. Contrary to all expectations and beliefs, it seems as though Wounded Wendy has managed to be fixed. We have, of course, the guardian angel of Wild Earth to thank, and by that, of course, I'm referring to Opa, who deals with all of our nonsense with our broken vehicles on a pretty much daily basis. Let's head across to Steph and find out what he's up to now that he's back on Wendy. O oh, ye of little faith, no, the magician Opa was back at it again and it seems like what we've got is we've got a problem with a missing spring and that spring jumps out every now and again causing too much pressure to go through the clutch system which causes 
liquid to pump out and that's what caused this particular one so we just put that back and now we are going to watch the sun set through the trees that's our plan we decided to come up onto this little bit of an elevated ridge here and share with you the last few rays of today it's always amazing at how quick the sun disappears or rises and disappears actually at this particular latitude and we are just south of the tropic of Capricorn and although that doesn't mean much it does mean that the sun rises and sets pretty quick with the quickest being on the equator where the earth spins at roughly 1,666 kilometers per hour. And as I was talking, the sun has disappeared, basically as quick as that. So, boom, sunset. And it, we have a very short twilight in South Africa. We probably have another about, say, 20 minutes or so of it being twilight like it is at the moment, and then it'll be pitch black, and then we'll be forced to use our spotlights and, uh, and go and look for all the nocturnal goodies. Now... The plan for the evening portion of this particular drive is to try and look after Wendy, I think, as a primary goal, <laughs> but also to go and follow up on some lion tracks that I saw around Bifelsuk Dam while we were limping back here. The tracks go straight to the water, and I think that there's a good chance that the Inkahuma Pride, which is a pride of lion that lives in that particular area of Juma into Torchwood and then across uh, north into um, into Bufosuk, our neighboring properties, um, there's a chance that they are in that area, in that particular area, and they came down to drink either early this morning or it was after game drive, just before it got a little bit too hot, and are lying up in that particular area again, which is quite exciting news. So I didn't see any of their tracks at the dam itself, but I did see tracks of a, of a, of a female and of a youngster. Um, and I'm gathering that either that female is there in that area with her babies or the entire pride is there somewhere in that area so we're off to go and see that and hopefully we'll either be lucky or we won't for those of you who have watched me on vehicle based safaris before you'll notice that quite often anything I predict is exactly the opposite of what happens in reality so we will probably end up somewhere close to Arethusa's main camp before the sun goes or before before the safari ends if history has anything to do with it but we're going to aim for a sort of easterly vector i think <laughs> so Good evening Arcadia, you've asked me if I would have anyone living or dead present on the back of the vehicle, who would it be? Whoa, that's a big one. Um, I don't know, I'm quite interested in these greats that the, the world seems to throw up from time to time. And by greats I mean massive personalities that get things right on a, on, a, on, a, on a global scale. Most recently would be probably Bill Gates I would imagine. Um, going back through the ages, it would be people like Albert Einstein, uh, Genghis Khan, Alexander the Great. Oh, you, you know, we could name them all. I'm just busy thinking in my mind back to one of my son's history books and uh, the pictures that he's got in them. But anyone that, that is great, I think living it would have to be Stephen Hawking, um, only because I enjoy that man's vision of where we are in space and time and I'd dearly love to have him on the back of our vehicle while we go on the safari. So living dead, it would probably be... I don't actually know. Let me think about that for a little bit there before I get back to you on that one. Alright, and here we have Karula's fresh track. So fresh indeed that I think we've probably just driven straight past it. <laughs> Coming up Philemon's dip. Let me see if I can show them to you. Excuse my funny facial expressions. <laughs> it's not uncommon for me to stick my tongue out while I'm concentrating quite hard. 
Let me get out and show you the track and it also give us some time to see if maybe we didn't. Quite often adult female leopard um, will wait for you to drive past and then jump out of the road back onto the track. But basically, can you see these tracks here? Let me see. There we go. Basically we have a track right here. It's made up of a front foot track, which is this one here, and a back foot track, which is this one here. And leopard are supposed to register when they're walking at a normal gait, which means that their, 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 their front foot gets stepped on by their back foot. In this particular case, her back foot has overstepped her front foot quite dramatically, and this tells me that she was moving incredibly fast up the road here. So it could be for any number of reasons um, that she's moving fast up the road here. I know it's an adult female leopard, just judging from the size. That's the, the size of an adult female leopard. Put my hand next to it for some size. Oh, size comparison at least and I know it's a female because if you have a look over here you'll notice that there's quite an acute angle there on that part of her pad here as well an acute angle there males have a round uh, are rounded their track would look rounded and then make that characteristic third hump females go out and come in and then have that let me see if I can get it right <laughs> there we go so females have an acute angle on the back of their planters pad on the side males are very much more rounded and bigger why I say this is fresh these tracks are very sharp you can have a look at the edge here very very sharp track there and this road is used quite heavily so I would imagine that Karula Adult female in this area, they're very territorial, wouldn't be another female. Might be, but the chances are quite low. Karula is en route to the lodge if she's not there already. Have a look at the dam cam uh, at Vuyatela. She might be over there. There was some impala around the area. Absolutely keep your eye on that camera tonight. She might come out. And she's heading straight towards where Sindile and Mvula are. Who knows why? Maybe she's wanting to... Oh. Apparently I've got no sound. Cam. Ah, ah, the dam cam is down. All right, all right. So the dam cam is down, so you won't be able to go there. But she's going to come out of this lodge. I think I'm going to turn around. As I predicted, there's something that comes along that absolutely de derails my plan for looking for the Nkumas. Let's see if we can't find her and find out what she's doing in this area. Not forgetting, she's got those two cubs at the moment. <laughs> All right, so let's turn the car around and let's see in which direction her tracks leave the road. All right, and while I scan the side of the road here, and I promise you, do not offer you the best or most entertaining view of the back of my head for the next 10 minutes or so, let's send you through to, uh, to Jamie with Mbula and Sindile. There's absolutely nothing wrong with the back of Steph's head. I think it's highly entertaining. Anyway, moving on to dozing Sundile as he attempts once again to find himself a comfortable spot, which he hasn't really managed to do. It doesn't look all that... Especially on the, the rough Tamburti bark, it must make it even more uncomfortable. I'm just looking at him and thinking he must he's close to two years old now I can't remember exactly what month he was born in but he must be close to two I think Sindila is going to be big I really do now I'm not sure if that's Tingana's genetics coming through Tingana being one of the potential fathers of Sindile oh and of course he also potentially is the great Anderson male's son not that I've yet to see the Anderson male but I've heard many stories and I have to tell you, I really do think he's going to be a big boy. There's just something about his size and the amount that he has grown in just the time that I saw him in... When did I see him? June. Yes, it was June. It was during the Father's Day specials. Um, during In June when I first saw him, it was the first time I'd seen him since he'd been released, there's a marked size difference in just a month's time, which I think is quite incredible. I really think he's going to 
give a few leopards a run for their money. And if he manages to survive this difficult time, and so far he's been doing a marvelous job of it, if he manages to survive this difficult time, he's going to be a force to be reckoned with. And I hope that he stays within an area where we get to see him. But even if he doesn't, hopefully he'll stay in the Sabi sands and we'll be able to keep track of his movements. And there we go. Anna in Connecticut is guessing at the length of him. And Anna says from the tip of his nose to the tip of his tail, he looks to be about 2 to 8 feet long. Would that be a good guess? Absolutely, that would be a very good guess. I would say closer to 6. I would say that is cl I think it's closer to 6 than 8 feet would be my estimate, just looking at him in the tree. He's just a lit yeah, he's just a little bit longer than me. I wouldn't put him much longer just yet. And that tail of course adds a good three feet onto his length. But six feet is a good guess in terms of how long he is. Now that for those of you not dealing in feet, that's about two meters long. Close to two meters long. They are they they are actually massive animals. We're just used to seeing them in comparison to lions, where they look much smaller. But they are big cats, the second biggest in South Africa. The other contender, of course, is the cheetah, which is just as long, and which we nearly saw this morning on the sunrise safari. Unfortunately, despite their shining fresh tracks in the dirt, they had crossed south into Mala Mala before we got to see them. Hopefully they will be back at some point in the next few days because I'm starting to feel we've had a serious cheetah drought over the last two weeks or so. Not that I can complain too much because we really have had the most marvelous experiences. And somewhere, we don't know where, because nobody's managed to find them today, but somewhere the Inkahuma pride with their little cubs must be hiding. I'm sure they managed to kill something last night. They were determinedly hunting. I have no doubt that they were successful. It's just a question of where they happen to manage to accomplish that. Now, chances are, I'm not, I don't know, I hesitate to say this, I don't think Sindila is going to be here tomorrow morning. I think Mvula is already going to be moving off, and I think that Sindile will probably be gone. However, I can promise you that we will be back to check up on him First thing tomorrow morning on the sunrise safari via the hyena dens, naturally, just to see whether or not there's any sign of them because I'm determined that Gwen is still on the property, the, the new mother of our brand new set of hyena cubs, and we haven't seen her in at least two weeks. I'm absolutely dying to see those cubs and how big they've got, but we just haven't managed to be lucky in terms of relocating her. I'm hoping she hasn't moved them back to where the rest of the clan is, on Manuletti. So that's a pretty, that's the summary of our big cats and hyenas and where they all are at the mo at present time. Shadow, by the way, just speaking of updates, Shadow is Sindile's mother. She has a four month old cub with her, little female, full of cheek and courage. I really, really like Shadow's little cub. And they've been found on Hoffman's, so south of our boundary. A cub is alive and well. And speaking of our spotted cats, Shamel, when did we last see Tingana? We last saw Tingana. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know when we last saw Tingana. I'm sorry, Shamal. However, he is on Torchwood. For, sorry, another update I forgot to give you. He is fast asleep next to a termite mound on Torchwood, the property to the east of our boundary. He, we just missed seeing him as well this morning. He, first thing in the morning, he wandered past. He actually, last night, he walked through Juma, found his tracks. He walked through Juma, into Cheetah Plains, did a big circle, and came north, in, went north into Torchwood. So he is alive and well in Torchwood. He's managed to kind of duck us because two days ago he was on Shirley's, which is west, at, south and west of Arethusa Airstrip. He then clearly walked through our property today, or last night, and he has dodged us. Hopefully, however, he is on his way, although 
Throwing him into the mix makes for a very confusing situation. He is probably just because Tingana often walks regular pathways in the same way Karula often walks regular pathways. He is probably going to come through onto Buffel's hook cut line, which is very, very close to where we are now. So there's a chance that he's going to pass through here sometime tonight. He was last I heard on the Game Drive channel, he was fast asleep on Torchwood. But chances are, now that he's done his territorial marking and boundary patrol, he's going to start moving across in this direction, unless he encounters something and makes a kill. The Tingana is, we've got a good chance of finding Tingana on the sunrise safari tomorrow morning. I'll put in a special effort for him as well. I feel like we've had so many cat sightings, it gets difficult to decide what to look for whenever you head out on drive. Hmm, shall I take leopards or lions today? Hmm, maybe some cheetah thrown into the mix. We've just been spoilt. It's good to see Sindire looking so healthy and happy. <laughs> Sindire once again readjusting his comfortable spot. Now there's plenty of speculation as to Sindile's father, and of course we will never know, and what well, we won't know until. We finally hear the results um, behind the DNA test that Panthera is carrying out on the various leopards of the Sabi San. And we may have to wait. Oh, hold on. Oh, shame, boy. She's not comfortable. He doesn't want to go down onto the ground because he knows that the smell of that kill is going to attract hyenas at some point. Although, at this point, he is more than a match for a hyena. He's much faster and more agile. Just can't quite find a comfortable spot. But yes, there's plenty of speculation. Dave, just go into the, his side there. We're right in the... Yes, right there. Oh, it's just the branch. I thought perhaps he had an injury. But he's fine. <laughs> My mistake. Uh, Kelly, there's... The reason that we speculate so much as to his potential paternity is because female leopards are incredibly promiscuous when it comes to mating with different males. And they do that deliberately. It's an evolutionary advantage in order to trick, to trick all of the dominant male leopards or all male leopards in the area into thinking they have fathered her cubs. Um, because the biggest male, uh, the biggest threat to a cub under the age of one years old in leopard terms is a strange male leopard. If you wanted to know about whether there's any physical attribute that a female leopard is attracted to, since you know there's studies that seem to suggest that female lions, lionesses, are more attracted to males with dark manes. In general, you will find the biggest, strongest male mating with a female in an area. Uh, that's just because they're dominant, they're constantly patrolling the area, and they will not tolerate the presence of any other leopard, male leopard in her vicinity. So I can't think of anything particularly. The bigger the male leopard, often the bigger their dewlap, the flap of skin around the front of their neck. And you might find that there's a correlation between ma females mating with males with a bigger dewlap um, as opposed to a smaller dewlap. However, I think that will probably just be a... It's it's correlation, not equaling causation. I think that they were, they would have been mating with that male anyway because he's bigger. There are even cases where a female has been mating with two big dominant male leopards in at one time. And what I mean by that is when they both come upon a female in estrus, if they don't want to risk fighting with each other or risk the injury to each other, it's similar to our gentleman's agreement that we've had here. And there are recorded cases of a female just mating with both of them. She'll move from one to the other. Uh, size counts in the leopard world, but it's also proximity. A female leopard that finds a male leopard, she'll go and mate with him. And she has that repetitive, the sort of the repeated matings, and le leopards mate even more frequently than lions do. We've seen them recently with Shaluva and Mvula mating pretty much every two minutes. And she'll do that because her ovulation, the release of her eggs, is stimulated by the repeated mating process. 
and that in turn is an adaptation to give the biggest and strongest male time to establish his dominance over her and over the other males around her and pass on the best possi possible genetics to her cubs. But that doesn't mean that if a female leopard comes upon a four-year-old male and there's no dominant male leopard in the area, it doesn't mean that she won't mate with him. The trick is for them to mate with as many fem males as they possibly can. And the same applies to lionesses. So although they mate mainly with the dominant coalition in an area, if they happen upon a nomadic male, <laughs> I'm just listening to the game drive comms. The guys are frantically searching for those lions, but they still haven't managed to find them. So it is a leopard-filled rather than a lion-filled afternoon today. And speaking of different leopards, let us find out from Steph how his search for Karula is going and what his plans are for the next few moments of the sunset safari. Thank you very much, Jamie. Uh, I can confirm that Karula has her two cubs with her. Just a little bit after we turned around, the cubs joined the road. They were sitting on top of a termite mound, obviously before I got there, but they were sitting on top of a termite mound just a little bit down the road. They rejoined her. So we do know that it's Karula, and I know that she's somewhere in the vicinity of Gallego and Vuyatela Lodge right now. We're just battling to find her. Um, and she's brought her cubs all the way up the side. I think it's for the first time with this particular litter, it's not uncommon for Karula, a leopard female in this area, quite an, an, uh, a, le a well-established leopard female in this, in this particular area, to bring her cubs to Gallego and Voyatella. I think she's even had one or two litters underneath the decks here. So it's a place that's well known to her. But for me, the easiest way to find leopard is to switch the engine off and to use my senses, particularly my ears, and also to come and check on all the impala herds in the area. Now, I'm under the understanding, or I'm under the belief, let me rather say, because it's, it's probably easier to put my, my faith in that, um, that leopard know exactly where the different impala herds move, from what area to what area and when, and they come and check on the various impala herds in an area. And uh, that's my hypothesis anyway. And right here is the impala herd that lives on top of quarantine. And you can see they've moved into the open. They spend their day in the thick bush around the edges of these clearings. And then they move out onto the clearings at night time, which makes it a lot more difficult for, for predators to, to actually catch them and sneak up on them. It's one of, their, one of their defense mechanisms. And these impala quite often alert us to the presence of predators by giving their very distinctive alarm snort when they see predators walking up and down this road. And this road that I'm on in particular is patrolled by all the leopards in this particular area. I've seen Mvula on here, Tengana on here, Karula on numerous occasions. And I'm just wondering if she's not in this particular area right now. She's obviously not here right now. That's the dominant ram. He'd be responsible for most of the pregnancies amongst these female impala they're almost all pregnant, all the adults will be pregnant. What he's doing there is a female has urinated onto that spot. He's then licked up that urine and he's, by flaring that top lip of his, he's activated an organ in the roof of his mouth, which allows him to analyze the chemistry of that particular urine. He's going to do it again with that females. There he stands there, licks his lips, adding a little bit of his own. <laughs> not the most dignified pose that we can have on this male and I think on that note we'll probably end up moving on the let's carry on on our search for Karula so she's obviously not pesting these impala just yet and what I think we're going to do is move around to the dam side of the lodge and see if she hasn't passed in front of the camp in front of where Brent and Jamie stay the tracks, I only saw tracks of the one young cub going in that direction. I actually thought she was heading straight towards quarantine and would come out somewhere here on one of these roads. But she hasn't made it quite across the clearing just yet, which is understandable. 
she would want to thick, uh, stick to the thicker bush areas if she had made this traverse during the day. And I think that that's exactly what she would have done. Walking fast, leopard tend to walk quite fast during the day. Club, cubs were going from termite mound to termite mound, boisterously moving across the, 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 the road in front of us. That's what I read from the tracks in any case. And she was either moving onto this open area or in front of it down to the water. Let's go down there and go and have a look. Now I tend to move from one area to another relatively quickly. And that's so that I can go into an area and then switch off and listen. Because as she'll be moving, she'll be disturbing the bush around her. She'll be disturbing Nyala and Kudu and Bushbuck and all manner of birds and animals and they would be reacting to that and giving alarm calls and alarm snorts and that's what we'd be listening to. Yes, absolutely. James Richard has just made a very, very agreeable comment there. And uh, James, you've said it's nice to know that the cubs are still doing so well and seem to be in good health. And just judging from the way that their tracks were, were spread out on the road, zigzagging left and right, uh, I can say that they're probably in very good health at the moment. So I share that sentiment. I'm sure everyone else does with you out there, James. And we're all very happy at Karula's managing to keep both young cubs alive and well. And that's just from her tracks. Let's see if she's done here. Now I've switched my engine off. But I'm looking to see if there's any tracks crossing here. This is a notoriously difficult area to track actually. And the reason for that is because it's so open. There's so many paths for a leopard to choose from. But it's quite difficult to predict where tracks would cross or where they're likely to cross. In thicker bush areas you just use game paths. But in these particular areas becomes a bit more tricky. Now there's nothing here that I can see. I think what I am going to do is go and definitely check the water and get my spotlight ready. Let's go and check the water. I don't think she'll bring her cubs down to drink. It's a it's a fairly exposed place for a leopard female to bring cubs of that age down to the water to drink in open daylight or even in twilight like this. There is a good chance that she's lying up just watching and seeing what's coming to the water. Making use of the dry time here. She's definitely not drinking. Making use of the dry time and the concentrations that it produces amongst all the herbivores. It's not uncommon for leopard and lion to use these water points as, as staging posts for their ambushes on the various on the various animals. I think we'll carry on going down Twin Dams Road. And just, just judging from these uh, particular cubs' behavior of them going up termite mounds and playing, that's exactly where I'm going to be concentrating my eyes over the next couple of minutes. But while we do that, you are lucky enough to be able to share the safari with one of Karula's uh, previous cubs. Oh no, sorry, not Karula's previous cubs, one of Shadow's previous cubs. Excuse me, that was almost a gross miscalculation on my part. Um, in any case, we are going to send you back to uh, Sindile with Jamie. See you later. Back across to Karula's grandson, <laughs> Sindile. And we've tried to reposition to find ourselves a slightly better view of him. And we've got at least a view of his face. 
Now, what I'm doing with the spotlight, just by the way, is I'm using, utilizing the edge of it rather than shining it directly upon him. It's because we are looking at him straight face on, so I don't want to make him uncomfortable in any way. But he's perfectly relaxed and still sleeping off or attempting to sleep off of rather full belly. He just hasn't quite managed to find a special spot just yet. I have to tell you, um, I I'm sure it is absolutely fine. Karula's mothering skills are truly fantastic. I would prefer not to have Karula and her cubs in this proximity to Sindile. They're still a good couple of miles away towards the Juma Dam. We're on the other side of the Voyatella Dam on the northern side. Steph has found her tracks on the southern side. It's just because, ideally, chances are absolutely nothing would happen, but ideally one would prefer not to have a young male leopard around her cubs that isn't directly familiar with her or directly related to them. He is related to them, of course. He, what would it be? What would it make him? They would be his... Oh, goodness. They would be his aunt and uncle, wouldn't they? Yes, because Karula is his mother's mother, and those are her cubs. Therefore, in the strange way of leopard lineages... <laughs> lineages? That's not a word. Lineages. Oh, big yawn. In the strained way of leopard family lines, yes, Karula's brand new five month old cubs, nearly six month old cubs, would be his aunt and uncle in a strange turn of affairs. We spoke about the amazing eyes that Mbula has. I think they are matched only by the beautiful brown eyes of Karula's newest female cub, <laughs> Sandile's aunt, in a strange way. Oh, this view that I thought I had found that was magnificent hasn't turned out to be quite so special. And welcome to Lucy, who I suspect is one of our newer viewers. Now, Lucy would like to know how it is we come to know the different leopards by their names since all leopards look the same to her and Lucy you are absolutely right at first glance all leopards are beautiful spotted cats obviously Sundila is very easy to identify because he's got the tracking collar on him Lucy it's amazing the more time you spend with the animals they become as easily identifiable as people that you know and some of our viewers have been watching for many, many years, and they have come to know our leopards exceptionally well. They've watched them for hours at a time, more. Uh, I, I wouldn't even begin to think about how many hours they've racked up in terms of watching the individual leopards. And as a result, you do come to know them. Now, we spoke about the identifying features, the fact that you can look at the leopard's spot patterns. Oh, another big yawn. I think he's thinking about moving. He might even be thinking about feeding. The leopards, the official way of looking at a leopard's whisker spot patterns, the spot patterns themselves on a leopard's face and the rest of their body. But you really do come to recognize an individual straight off the bat by their size, the shape of their facial features. Um, Karula, for example, her family line, Shadow, her daughter Tandi, they all have slightly more flattened profiles to their face than some of the other leopards out here. And you really do, you, you come to recognize them very, very quickly. And then, of course, there's the fact that we, we recognize the individuals by the area that they're in. So Steph has found tracks with cubs around the Juma Dam and around quarantine. Now, immediately he knows that is Karula. It's possible, in that sort of slim 1% chance, that it is another female with young cubs. But going that far into Karula's territory, it's highly, highly unlikely, especially with young babies. So you can almost guarantee with 100% certainty that those are Karula's tracks. Just in the same way that when we tracked Sindile from Arethusa, we could almost guarantee that it was him. Before we actually saw him, we knew that we were tracking him. We knew that we were looking for him. And I begged Herbert to help me find him, which he did marvelously. We have him to thank for this incredible sighting. We have me to thank for this slightly ridiculous view. Like, oh, hold on, listen. And 
Lions. Awesome. Hmm. Watching a leopard in a tree, listening to lions roar. What a beautiful winter's evening. Uh, station's audio of Angola. There's one calling between Aubrey's and Gallego shortcut still. Might even be on Gallego shortcut itself at this point. And then one that sounds like he's calling from maybe Tamboerti Dam, Bivels or Cutline side. And up Cindy Lay goes to feed upon the carcass. Copy that text. I'll check Gallego shortcut. I'll keep you updated in a moment. Okay, let's try reposition. He's feeding and he's popped himself in an almost impossible to see position. So while we reposition, let us send you back across to Steph for an update on his side. Thank you very much, Jamie, and you caught us in the act of one of those moments of silence that I'm having around the area where we last had Karula and the two cubs tracks, which is not too far away, probably about 100 yards from where we're sitting right now, was the last time that I saw tracks on the road of, uh, of the cubs and Karula. But what it's also given us is it's given us the most wonderful sunset or twilight view over my head there and what can probably only be Venus or Jupiter alright while we're busy reminiscing like that we're quickly gonna throw you over to Jamie Cindelia's on action again I haven't needed to reposition because Cindelia has done it for us but I have to tell you, this is such a beautiful view. I just wanted us to enjoy the silhouette for a moment. I promise I'll put the lights back on just now. Oh, that's so South African. I will, I will put my light on in a moment. He just had this marvelous silhouette, but now he's settled down. So his silhouette is a little bit more indistinct. And we can pop the spotlight back on. There isn't anywhere at uh, all. Wonderful. That's definitely improved matters, hasn't it, Dave? Oh, yes. Absolutely. <laughs> well done, Dave. <laughs> Managing to make up for poor positioning by focusing in through the Tamburti leaves. Not an easy thing to do with my light shining on it. Okay, for real, let's reposition. I think we're going to get a better view from the other side. Sorry, everybody. Take my spotlight off because this is a beautiful image. And then let's try and go backwards. <laughs> Dodge the Tambuiti tree behind me because we absolutely do not drive over Tambuiti trees. Turn my backlight on so we don't go careering off the wall. So while I concentrate on not smacking Dave, which I think I've just done, sorry Dave, let's go back to Steph for his sunset. Have a look at how beautiful that is. I know it's got nothing on a leopard moving around with kills, but I find this quite some of my favorite skies are these winter skies and the stars that come with it and everything else that we can see at the moment. Right now the bush around it is quiet, church mouth quiet. It's quite eerie the fact that there's nothing going on. I can hear a few thick knees calling in the distance and I have heard a buffalo bellow. But none of those frantic alarm calls that I'm expecting from a leopard who's moving her cubs through the area. Now it's not to say that she's not in this area. She might be giving her cubs a little bit of a break. They might be on top of a termite mound. She might be having a bit of a break. It's not easy bringing up two youngsters, two boisterous youngsters, as many of you would know. And I'm, there's a good chance that she's gone and laying down somewhere, somewhere waiting for full dark. It's not easy bringing up two youngsters, two boisterous youngsters, as many of you would know. And I'm, there's a good chance that she's gone and laying down somewhere, somewhere waiting for full darkness before she starts moving around. Nevertheless, 
It's given us a wonderful opportunity. So Tasha has asked a nice question, would Karula have stashed her cubs to go on the hunt? Absolutely, Tasha. They'd be way too young at the moment. They're probably around about five months old at the moment. I'm not exactly sure exactly when they were bought, um, as I'm not always on game drive. Um, but they're probably around about four or five months old at the moment and um, not able to stay with her when she hunts. So she'll move them from one area to another, quite often then going off to hunt and then either bringing them two kills if the kill is too large for her to move easily, or bringing the kill back to her cubs again, uh, if it's easy enough to move. Um, and she'll carry on doing this. Uh, if there's a male and a female, the male will probably leave her anywhere from about nine months old to about 16 months old. Female leopards can even stay up to 24 months with their mother or in the vicinity of their mother. Um, so she's got a long time ahead of her still. But as they get a bit older, they will start to join her on hunting. But leopard definitely are those solitary cats, very similar to your house cat, that will hunt alone, not cooperatively like you do find with the lions. So with lions, female lions from about six months old to about nine months old, they'll start to join into the hunts uh, and help to bring down prey and to set ambushes. Uh, male lions will join at about nine months or so and then just sort of get lazier from there until they get kicked out of the pride, but also adding their weight when need be. Um, but leopard definitely, absolutely uh, hunt solitarily. Now, with so little time left, it's time for myself and Khat to say goodbye. As a reminder though, keep watching tomorrow don't forget we have Brent who is right now climbing onto an airplane and flying all the way up to Uganda we've got a special coming to you on Friday where we are going to be trying to bring you Safari Live from the gorillas in Uganda that's exactly right you heard me from gorillas and we're going to try and do it live tomorrow we're going to see if we can get into the forest and do a bit of a tester with the real show being on Friday Keep your eye on our blogs. We'll keep you updated there. But we're going live with gorillas this week. Yes, please. <laughs> All right. And on that note, at least from myself, uh, I hope you have a good evening. I'm definitely going to. We will see you again tomorrow. And from myself and Khat, good night and goodbye. I am so excited. Sorry, we have repositioned, but I'm so, so excited about these gorillas. I can barely speak about them. The only thing I can say is that it is wonder, not Uganda, that uh, the guys will be doing the live filming in. So just a minor correction there. Slight subtle difference between the two African countries. But if you think I'm excited, you should have seen how Brent Leo Smith bounced out of here this morning away from camp with a big smile all over his face. I think he cannot wait to head across there. Right, on things closer to home, we have got, once again, award-winning views of Sindila eating from the impala carcass. There's not very much left. I think there's a chance he will be gone by tomorrow. He might stick around in the tree, though, because those lions are very, very close. Uh, we'll have a look for them on our way home at the end of our sunset safari. But for now, we have come to the close, and we'll be back here first thing tomorrow to check up on Sindile's progress and Mvula's progress and Karula's progress. So many things to find you. We won't know where to begin. We won't be finding gorillas, but Brent will certainly be on the search for them by Thursday and Friday. I hope you're all as excited as we are for that particularly what promises to be a spectacular event. Cindy is about to fall out of the tree, but we have come now. <laughs> He's not going to, I'm joking. We've come to the end of our sunset safari. So it's time for us to say our goodbyes and thank yous. A thank you to Dave, as well as a thank you to Lou and Rebecca and Chelsea in final control. Most importantly, a big thank you to all of you across the globe watching our live safari twice a day, every day. Have a wonderful day and join us for the sunrise safari. Bye-bye, everybody.